Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you are doing in our lives. We thank you for allowing us to be here today. Lord, we pray that you will organize our minds to be able to perceive what you have allowed us to learn from this training. That Lord Jesus will also anoint our teacher, that the teacher will be able to have the right vocabulary to speak. And that Lord Jesus, at the end of this, will be able to be edified, to also edify your church that you are giving us to lead. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, last week we started off with the book of Ephesians. Uh, we kind of looked at the background of Ephesus and the kind of culture that the believers were living in. And we also looked at the main focus of chapters 1 and 2, uh, in which Paul is telling the Gentile believers uh, that they are on equal footing with the uh, Jewish believers that they are in no way inferior, that they too have been given uh, the, the riches you know, of Jesus Christ. And in fact, he kind of makes a, a, uh, offers a prayer for them uh, so that they can you know, um, enter into all of these riches and privileges which, which are theirs. We also looked at how Christ in himself, in his body, in his flesh, he has uh, broken down that uh, dividing wall of hostility that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles earlier. Uh, so, uh, so Paul is kind of affirming, uh, allowing the believers to know that they have nothing to feel bad about, that they are valued in God's eyes, uh, that they are as valuable as the Jewish believers. So we see all of that uh, in uh, the chapter chapters one and two. So here we are coming into chapters three and four, uh, where he continues this idea uh, because you know he started talking about it as a mystery in the last class he says it this is the mystery which um, people in the past could not understand in the old testament times um, people were aware that an outsider a foreigner can come into the land of israel and choose to make yahweh their god and if they do so yes yahweh's mercy and forgiveness will extend even to that foreigner but that foreigner would first have to uh, submit to the Mosaic law. He would have to become um, uh, a, a Jew in, in, in the sense. Uh, he would also undergo circumcision and then he would follow all of the procedures uh, which uh, you know, were laid down for the, uh, for the biological Jewish people. So um, all of this the person would have to undergo. And so they were familiar with the idea that God's mercy does extend to other nations. But um, here in this uh, New Testament times, we discover that the Gentile believers don't even have to follow the Mosaic law. They're completely free from it all. And uh, this was something that the Jewish believers were kind of finding difficult to digest. This was something ent entirely new to them. And we see that struggle actually going on, uh, you know, when we when we look at uh, the book of Acts and we look at the book of uh, the, the letter to the Galatians. In all of this, we kind of get a hint of the real tension that was actually there going on in the early church. You know, I mean, we who live so many centuries later, we have got very used to the idea that, yes, we are as equal, uh, you know, uh, with the Jewish believers as anyone. So we are very comfortable with the idea. But then at that time, when, they, when, they, when this new concept was still coming in, there was a lot of tension. Um, and um, the leaders of the early church, Paul and the, uh, and the apostles and, and all of the other leaders, had to deal with this almost on a daily basis. This is something that they lived with. you know, And we don't quite catch that uh, living so many centuries later. But that was the situation over there. Uh, so. Uh, 
when we look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, we again see, you know, um, this a uh, hint of this. Um, if someone could just read out for us that one little verse right in the beginning, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, please. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for the Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Yes. Uh, so over here, um, Paul says, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. It is for your sake that I became a prisoner. So, you know, if, if my ministry had not been among you Gentiles, I would still be free. I would still, uh, you know, be able to, you know, move on with my ministry, with my life. Uh, but then because of uh, my ministry among you Gentiles, I'm actually now a prisoner. If you remember, we looked in the background last time. Um, this uh, letter to the Ephesians was written during his first imprisonment. And uh, so just kind of, you know, to get an idea of, um, of the events that took place, you know, just as a reminder, uh, you know, if we were to go to Acts chapter 21, and uh, we have this entire chunk over there, you know, verses from 17 up to 29, Acts chapter 21 verses 17 to 29 in that uh, in that whole big chunk we kind of get a um, background of what was going on at that time in the early church and uh, why uh, paul gets arrested why he ends up in the first imprisonment uh, so in acts 21 uh, if we see you know Paul goes over there to Jerusalem and he's received very, very warmly by the believers over there. They are very happy to uh, see him. He talks about the ministry that he's doing among Gentiles and how there are lots of Gentiles coming to the Lord. And the believers in Jerusalem are very happy about that. They're so glad to know that so many people are coming into the kingdom, even from among the Gentiles. They are happy about all of that. But there's also this underlying tension you know that's there and we catch that in in the verses which are mentioned over there so acts chapter 21 verse 20 this is what they say when they heard this they praised god then they said to paul you see brother how many thousands of jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. And in verse 22, you know, look at the, what the leaders are saying. They say, what shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites and pay their expenses. Uh, and why are they asking him to do this? then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you but the law that we believers do not have to follow the mosaic law it has been very clearly established that salvation is not going to be earned by keeping the mosaic law and yet you have all these thousands of jews who have come to the lord and they are still in that old mentality they still value those that mosaic law which you know was passed down uh, to them generation after generation for thousands of years and so they are not able to just let go of that lightly and so even after becoming uh, believers they are still holding on to those mosaic traditions uh, they are still following many of those pharisaical you know uh, uh, rituals and customs which were laid down because in their minds, they associate godliness with following those things. If they, when, if they do those things and keep those things, it makes them feel more godly about themselves. And so they're actually holding on to those things, which is what the leaders point out in Acts 21, 20. They say, oh, thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. And they are rather upset about this. Um, bits of news which are coming back to them, you know, regarding Paul and how he is going around telling the Jewish people, you know, who are living with the Gentiles saying, you know, 
don't need to get into circumcision and all of that. You don't need to follow the laws of Moses. And they're kind of upset about what Paul has been teaching. And so the, the leaders say over here in verse 22, what shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, you know, that you've arrived over here in Jerusalem. And uh, they, there may be some um, uh, confusion. You know, there may be some kind of a protest or a position raised. So, you know, we need to be cautious. We cannot have the church divided. Uh, you see, at that time, the church was in its infancy. Okay, it, it, the church is just getting established. So the leaders had to be very wise. They had to be very carefully led by the Holy Spirit in every little thing. They could not just randomly say things and do things which would end up, you know, um, maybe harming the faith of the new believers. So they had to tread very carefully. And so they say, you know, at least these believers need to know that you, Paul, who are from a Jewish background, you are not being disrespectful to the traditions which were followed all through our lives, you know, generations uh, from, from the time of Moses. Uh, so you, even though you have now gone uh, and, and uh, to the Gentiles and you are doing your ministry, and yes, even though it is definitely authorized by Christ himself that we don't have to follow the Mosaic law any longer, you, however, as a man from a Jewish background, you are being respectful of our culture. You are following our traditions. So let them understand that. Let them see that you yourself are being obedient to the law, which is what they say in Acts 21, verse 24. They say, um, everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And, and then they you know, clearly admit in verse 25, they say, as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should you know, abstain from certain things. So the Mosaic law does not apply to them. They don't have to follow it. That is not how salvation is earned. Uh, so they're very clear about that. So this is not a matter of doctrine, but this is a matter of sensitivity uh, to, the, to the cultural, uh, you know, um, beliefs of this set of people who still have not yet come out of that mindset, uh, which is what we saw happening even in, in the letter to the Galatians, right? I mean, uh, these Jewish believers who were still, who had placed their trust in Jesus Christ, no doubt about that. Their salvation was just based upon their faith in Jesus Christ as being divine and the one who has, you know, the power to forgive them of their sins because of what he did on the cross. They are very clear about the doctrinal details. But somewhere in their unrenewed minds, they are still thinking, oh, if I keep these, these mosaic laws, then I am more holy. So they kind of had this tendency to look upon the other believers, the Gentile believers as being ah, slightly inferior, not our class, uh, not up to the mark the way we are. What do they know? You know? They've come from a Gentile background. They're like almost animals, you know, pagans. They know nothing. We, on the other hand, we know what godliness is all about. So somewhere in their hearts, these new believers still have this kind of, uh, it's kind of a thinking that somehow following the Mosaic traditions makes them superior to the other believers. And we see that kind of coming out in the Galatian letter. And uh, so over here in Ephesians, Paul is doing his best to assure these Ephesian believers, who are almost all of them Gentiles, you know, they probably had a small mix of Jewish uh, believers among them, but they were mainly a Gentile uh, congregation. So he is, you know, telling them, you're in no inferior, uh, you know, you, 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 you don't have to think of yourself as inferior in any way, um, you know, so he's trying to uh, bring about the, that teaching over here. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, you know, going back to Acts 21. Uh, so Paul actually goes, you know, he, he, he accepts the counsel and advice which the other leaders are giving. He goes over there to the temple. He undergoes those, you know, um, rituals that uh, he is supposed to. He does all of that. And um, so in fact, everything seems to have got resolved quite well. You know, I mean, uh, he has in no way shown disrespect, all of that. And then uh, in Acts 21, verse 27, some Jewish people, probably not even believers, they uh, from the from Asia Minor, they see Paul over there at the temple and they make an assumption that he has taken um, a, a, a Gentile, a Greek, a Greek believer into the temple. That's a, a wrong assumption that they have made. Paul did not do any such thing. 
he went into the temple with four other Jewish people and did whatever rituals were required. Uh, he did not take any Greek believers into uh, the inner courts. He did not do that. This is an assumption which they make. And so they start off a riot um, uh, at chapter 21, verse 28. They say they start shouting and they say, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And everyone gets really worked up and they say, ha, look at this man. How can he defy our mosaic uh, traditions? How can he do this to our, uh, you know, uh, our background, our, our culture and all of that? And they all get really worked up. You know, that's the problem with ethnic issues. Um, uh, you know, people kind of get out of uh, control. Uh, so. It is good for us to value our ethnicity. It is very, very good for us to hold on to our uh, culture uh, because, I mean, after all, you know, good people have uh, come up with all of those systems and traditions and all of that. But if it is in any way pagan and if it is in any way going against the scriptures, then we are very careful to keep our hands clean of all of those aspects of, of the culture. So um, here, you know, these people get all worked up that their culture is being trampled by this man, Paul. Wrong impression, which because Paul was not doing that. He was going out of his way to show how respectful he is. But so as a result of that, you know, the whole imprisonment happens. He gets sent to Rome. He says, I want to appeal to Rome. So he's sent over there. And he's you know now in his first imprisonment. So that is the background. So he points out, he points out the fact that I have become a prisoner because of my ministry among you Gentiles. And why have I gotten into trouble? Because I have been openly declaring that you Gentile believers are in no way inferior. So he is basically telling them, believe what I am saying. In fact, I am here in chains because of what I have been preaching. So this is not just a casual uh, comment that I am making. It is very true that there are thousands of Jewish believers out there who are looking upon you as being inferior. But know this in your heart, in your mind, irrespective of what they are saying about you, you guys are in every way equal with them because Jesus Christ has given you that status. So this was, you know, he was renewing their minds. He was helping them to understand what Jesus Christ has actually achieved. And I think it probably took a few generations for that to sink into their heads. You know, um, I mean, so now we are so comfortable with the idea. We know for a fact that we are in every way equal to the Jewish believers. But back then, it was something that it took a few generations, I think, probably to really for them to absorb that and for, for that to be established inside their heads. <laughs> so Paul, you know, kind of got the process going. So if today if we in our Gentile uh, communities enjoy the status that we do, it's because people like Paul and others spoke up, you know, spoke up for, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and clarified uh, who we are and what our status is. Because most of us, you know, are from the Gentile community. I mean, very few of us have a Jewish background. Um, so uh, coming to verse 2, if someone could read out for us verse 2, please. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. He uh, he says, there has been a stewardship of God's grace that has been given to me for you. As in, uh, God has asked me to be the steward and, you know, uh, administer certain uh, things to you. I have been asked to administer grace to you. And uh, when we think of the word grace, we're just basically mainly thinking of divine favor, you know. Uh, but uh, in the New Testament, wherever you have this word grace being used, it's actually being used in four different senses. You know, we, uh, we get four different meanings out of it. So we need to understand that over here when he's saying I'm administering God's grace to you, it's not just talking about, you know, it's not just saying that, um, you know, I'm, I'm telling you people that God's favor is upon you. No, uh, he's talking about even the other aspects of grace, you know, in the way the term was used back then. So it's actually there in your notes. Uh, there are uh, four different ways in which the term grace is used. Um, grace actually talks about the divine character of God himself. Uh, so 
in that sense, uh, the grace which is administered to us, that's basically the nature of God, the character of God, uh, which is being administered to us. We are meant to walk like Christ. So God gives his grace to us uh, in that sense, you know, that we become more like Jesus Christ. Uh, we are built up in our character. So that is one way that grace is given to us. We are given this uh, character of God. We are given this ability to start becoming like him uh, you know, uh, in his nature. So that is one aspect of grace that we receive. But there are another, of, and of course, there's a popular one which we're all familiar with, where you have divine favor. God is no longer angry with us because Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sins. So therefore, there is divine favor resting upon us now. So that, of course, is, is the popular um, meaning of grace that we are all very familiar with. And the term grace is also used for uh, divine empowering. Um, so when, 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 when in the scriptures, when it says that grace is being extended to you, uh, you know, it's not just divine favor, but also out of that divine favor, now because God's favor is upon you, you are being empowered to, you know, uh, to live in a whole new way. You are being empowered uh, to be able to claim the riches which belong to you. You know, so you're empowered uh, to, 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 to be able to minister to the ministry that God has placed in your hands. So there's divine favor, there is divine empowering, uh, there is also this divine character of God that is being imparted to us. And then the fourth meaning of grace, uh, which we see in the scriptures, is um, the gifts which have been given, the spiritual gifts. They also are, are referred to as uh, the grace of God. So these four different things, um, God gave Paul the responsibility of being a faithful steward and administering these four different aspects of grace to the Jewish people, uh, to, the, to the Gentile people, so that they too, you know, um, can enjoy these four aspects of grace that God is offering. So he, it is his responsibility to make them aware that they have access to these four types of grace and it is his responsibility to help them to uh, to uh, to walk into those things to claim those things you know to have those things in their everyday christian life so uh, he as their um, you know um, servant he as their apostle he would actually teach them you know to to walk in all those four forms of grace uh, that are available uh, so, which is why he says, you know, uh, I am in chains, uh, you know, I'm a prisoner because uh, of my ministry among you. And this is the ministry that has been given to me among you, that I should administer these four forms of grace to you and help you to, you know, claim them in your Christian life. Uh, so then he moves on into verses three and four, um, where he again touches upon this whole idea of mystery, where you know, basically he's talking about how this um, equality of Jewish and Gentile believers uh, is, is something that God had planned uh, all uh, you know, right from the beginning, even before the foundations of the world. Uh, but it's only now that people are becoming aware of it. OK, so he uh, starts talking about that. Uh, so if someone could read out verses three and four. Makes me wonder whether there's anyone at all behind those tiles. Yeah. Come on. How by that revelation he has made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay, so he says, uh, this mystery uh, was made known to me by divine revelation. Uh, Jesus Christ himself revealed this to me. Uh, you know, like he had said earlier in the other epistle, this is not something that I received from humans. Jesus Christ himself has revealed this to me. And that is why I am doing this ministry among the Gentiles, because God himself has told me that the Gentiles are equal with the Jewish believers. Uh, so uh, he says, this is my, you know, um, so I'm writing all this so that you also will be able to understand these insights which have been given to me by Jesus Christ about his mystery. 
and then he goes on to say in verses 5 and 6 earlier people were not aware of these facts uh, so if someone could read out verses 5 and 6 which was not made known to the sons of men in other generation as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he says, uh, it was not made known to people in other generations, but now you know it's being revealed by the Spirit uh, to God's holy apostles and prophets. Uh, so um, he he you know points out that in earlier generations people did not know about this mystery and i think we touched upon first peter chapter 1 um, i think probably in one of the previous classes uh, you know but just to uh, look at that once again uh, first peter 1 verses 10 to 12 okay so in first peter 1 verses 10 to 12 you know he says um, the prophets who were in pa in the past they searched intently and with the greatest care, they searched the scriptures because they wanted to understand all these things uh, that the Holy Spirit is kind of hinting and they want to know the details. Um, you know, so it, it and it says in First Peter 1 verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you so these things were not clear at that time but they kind of sensed that god is doing a greater work and it, this work will not just extend to the gen not to the jewish jewish people alone but it will even extend to the uh, gentile um, community as well so they kind of uh, partially caught a glimpse of these things uh, in the uh, old testament times uh, but Paul says now it has been, you know, this all this is being very, very clearly revealed to you by the uh, Spirit of God, is what he says. And uh, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, brother Shay, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Pastor. Sorry to pick you back. Um, I just wanted to ask, ask a question on the whole um, aspects of grace. Um, to an extent, I think that there are two folds to favor, but do you think um, the divine favor you talked about here is talking about salvation? Yeah, the grace has been extended for us to be saved, but it's also yeah. a continued grace in the sense uh, that now that he has accepted us as his children, um, you know, he and we continue to sin even after salvation. You know, you see that that's there, right? Uh, because we our unrenewed mind is still around, and our body, uh, which is you know susceptible to fleshly desires, all of that is still there. Uh, so we are still learning to become like Jesus Christ, but we have, we have not yet become perfect, uh, at least in practice. Positionally, of course, we are right. So, uh, so because of this. There's a continued grace that needs to continue resting upon us uh, till this, you know, th till this becomes an accomplished fact. Once we are in heaven and we see him, we will be like him. But right now, the process is still kind of going on, that process of sanctification. So in that sense, there is a continued grace that would have to continue being extended to us even after salvation. So at the moment of salvation, yes, we entered into the grace, uh, but the, the divine favor that grace is ha, has to continue continue being granted to us and over here we are talking about grace in the sense of uh, favor in the sense of mercy being shown to people who don't actually deserve mercy but it's being shown to them because uh, Jesus Christ has you know uh, already paid the price on their behalf uh, so I would say grace uh, is uh, available at the moment of salvation. But then after that also it needs to continue and that it continues being extended to us every day yeah does that help that, uh, that, yeah. that helps that helps Thank you, sure. that helps. Yeah. Thank you. uh so um yeah so we looked at how in the past the people were not very aware of this of this mystery of the jews and gentiles being one but now it has been revealed and uh, so then he goes on to elaborate further 
uh, if someone could read out verses 14 to 19 if someone could read out 14 to 19 14 to 19 and it reads for this reason i bow my knees to the father of our lord jesus christ from who from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he who that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that christ may dwell that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you have been rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Yes. So he, this is the second prayer that Paul is praying for the Ephesians. Uh, we saw that other beautiful prayer which he prayed, you know, in, in the previous chapter. Uh, so now over here, there's one more lovely uh, prayer that he's praying. And uh, you see, he's praying these prayers because these Jewish, uh, these Gentile believers are still not understanding the status they have, especially because the, uh, the Jewish believers are not even treating them as equals. So because they don't have confidence in themselves, they're not really able to see who they are. Uh, they're kind of, you know, uh, living a lower level of life. Uh, they're not really walking into and enjoying all the privileges because probably in their minds, they're also thinking, oh, yeah, you know, we are like from a Gentile background. So, yeah, we are not really as privileged as these other people. And so, yeah, I mean, these riches, even though they are there, uh, they may, I think they'll probably, you know, those riches will go to the gen, to, to the Jewish people because of their superior position. We, on the other hand, what do we know? We are, from, we, are we came from a pagan back, background, so maybe these things don't really apply to us the way they apply to those people. And so they also would have had all these wrong thoughts in their minds. And uh, so, you know, he prays the previous prayer for them so that they will, uh, you know, walk in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And so now over here again, he's uh, kind of praying along similar lines. And he says, you know, there is one family. He talks about how part of the family is in heaven, you know, as in uh, the Old Testament believers, um, you know, all those who trusted in Yahweh and stayed committed to him uh, for salvation. So those people, they are part of the family is already in heaven and part of the family is here on earth. And these Gentiles are part of this divine family. So he says, you people are part of this divine family. And uh, so he says, this is my prayer for you that uh, in that God will strengthen you, you know, on the inside, in your inner person, that God will strengthen you using his glorious riches. You know, so, so uh, that's the first prayer point that he makes for them. Uh, there are five things over here in this, you know, in this passage, which we just read out. And uh, the first of them is this, where he says, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Uh, so, uh, in the same way, this prayer applied to the people back then. Uh, you know that this prayer applies even uh, to us believers today. You know, so if we are living, and you know, if we are, if we are feeling like we are this very substandard, very average believers who will never really amount to anything, then you know these words are for us. You know. Um, if we, if you're always feeling, oh, I will never really be able to overcome temptation. Oh, I will never really be a victorious Christian. I will always be an average failure. You know, or, or you know, if you if you're thinking, oh, the other people, the way they hear from God, you know, they're so guided by His Spirit. I, on the other hand, I seem to be spiritually deaf. I don't think I'll ever be able to hear from God. Or you know, you're saying to yourself, um, you know, I wish I could serve the, you know, I too want to serve the kingdom of God. I too want to contribute something. But what do I have in my hands? I really am nothing much. So I think whatever I'd manage to contribute to the Lord, it's not going to be of any great significance. So these may be, may be all of the negative thoughts that may be going through a believer's mind. And we are told over here, you know, um, 
may you know this this should not be your uh, thought uh, this should not be your uh, you know belief regarding yourself why because um, god's uh, you know god's glorious riches have been given for one purpose to strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being um, so it's not just going to be a little bit of strengthening that god can act that jesus christ can do for you he will strengthen you uh, to the extent of his glorious riches you know all the spiritual riches which are ours all of that uh, is available even to the uh, least believer the believer who thinks that he is the weakest the believer who thinks that he will never really amount to anything in the kingdom of god this these glorious riches extend to even that person because god wants to use his glorious riches to strengthen even that person and he's not going to be strengthening that person um with just some kind of a temporary uh, strength he is going to be using his own resurrection power to resurrect all those areas in that person's life you know uh, that need to be sparked back into uh, into life uh, you know so that he so that he will be a person who's on fire for god so god will do that and god has the capacity to use his resurrection power to do that for us so we should not have this kind of defeatist attitude thinking oh i can never amount to anything um the basic lesson over here is that stop putting trust in yourself stop looking at yourself and your limitations and saying oh okay fine you know i trust in myself and this is the extent to which i can go so this is all i am stop trusting in yourself start trusting in jesus christ start trusting in his resurrection power please trust in what jesus christ accomplished on the cross i mean we we trust him for our salvation right i mean uh, we are we are very very confident that whatever he did on the cross it has uh, you know been applied to us as far as salvation is concerned so we know that now we are believers you know that we are part of the family of god that we have, we, we seem to accept but then when it comes to other aspects you know where we are meant to live in victory where we are meant to be people who will make meaningful contributions to the kingdom you know when it comes to such things uh, we we think oh um, this is something that i have to do on my own no stop trusting in yourself begin to trust in his resurrection power which has no limits which can accomplish you know things which are which go beyond uh, you know your expectations and so he says this is my prayer for you guys he says i pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being this is something that god can actually do for you so that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith so he's basically saying uh, you know um, because christ because god is going to strengthen you on the inside using his resurrection power you will be able to dwell in christ what on earth does that mean you know what does he mean by saying that because of what christ is going to, because of what god is going to do with his resurrection power uh, you're going to be able to dwell in christ aren't we already dwelling in christ i mean uh, because you know if you look at uh, galatians 4 6 over there it says because you are his sons god sent the spirit of his son into our hearts the spirit who calls out abba father so we we already have the holy spirit dwelling in us so what does it mean uh, when it says over here now because of the resurrection power which is going to be imparted to you now because of this resurrection power which is going to strengthen you now you will be able to you know have christ um, uh, dwelling in you in what sense does he mean over here he's actually talking about how christ is going to be formed in you christ is already dwelling in you through his holy spirit that happened right from the moment of salvation over here what he's talking about when he says christ may dwell in your hearts through faith he is basically saying even as you place your faith in what jesus christ has done even as you place your faith in the resurrection power of god to be able to accomplish anything and everything even as you place your simple basic childlike faith in what jesus christ has accomplished even as you're doing that 
Christ will start being formed in you. God will do it. He will accomplish it. And uh, so, you know, the, um, this is the theme which is kind of running through all of Paul's letters. Uh, so even in other letters, he, he refers to this. Uh, if you will over to look at Galatians 4, 19, he says, you know, um, I'm in the, you know, he says, I'm again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So his longing, uh, the goal towards which he is working is so that uh, Christ in all of his, you know, completeness is formed in us, in our character, in our thinking, in our responses, uh, in, the, in the choices we make on a daily basis. We literally should become like Christ in all of those areas. And that is his desire. He says the same thing again in Colossians 1, 28, where he says, uh, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. OK, so in so in that sense, he is saying, you know, there are glorious riches which have been made available to believers. So God is going to use these glorious, glorious riches and is going to use his resurrection power to um, to strengthen you on the inside so that Christ will be formed in you. You know, you, you'll start becoming Christ-like. This is something that God will do for you. Um, and then it goes on to say in the next portion, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Okay, So uh, the third prayer point that he's making is that these believers should be rooted and established in love. Um, you know, like we know, uh, the basic, uh, the basic foundation of everything that we are, everything that we do, it is love, God's love. Because God loved us, now we are able to, you know, do all of these things. So, so become rooted in this love. Be completely confident that you are loved to an extent where God will do these things inside you. So you do not have to have a defeatist attitude and think, oh, I will never amount to anything. God's love towards you is great enough that he will do this by his power. But you from your side have to be believe. Your faith has to be at actively at work where you say, yes, even as I wait on the Lord every day, even as I do my own little you know, prayer time and my own little Bible reading, it will not, it will not be the way Billy Graham did his Bible reading. But even at my level, even as I am making my own efforts to fellowship with him by his resurrection power, he will do this for me because he loves me that much. So become rooted in his love. Become you know established in his love. Don't even have any doubts about what Christ can accomplish in your life. You know, so these are big words that Paul is using because he really wants them to catch who they are. And you know, not just get discouraged because the, a bunch of Jewish believers think about them badly. You know, so uh, he's you know he's uh, he's kind of saying, you know, this is my prayer that you will be able to grasp these things, that you know these things will become a reality in your life. So he says, being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So he says, this is something. As long as you're not very confident about how loved you are, you will all continue to think, oh, I will not amount to anything. But once you start catching this concept of how deeply, greatly you are loved, you know, then, then you will be so confident that you will place your faith with full confidence in what Christ is going to be giving, is going to be doing for you. You'll start waiting for it with eager anticipation. You'll start laying aside all the things which are hindering, and you know, you'll you'll prepare yourself so that He will turn you into this Christ-like person. So there will be this eagerness, eagerness, this anticipation, because now you really believe that this is something that's actually going to happen to you in your lifetime. OK, it's not just something that's going to happen to some big uh, hi-fi believers. It's going to happen even to you. Why? Because you kind of started to understand the width and the length and the height and the depth of the love of this Jesus Christ for you. You're kind of beginning to grasp it. And, um, um, you know, so that we, we see this, you know, same concept uh, being brought out even in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. Uh, Romans 8, 35 to 39, where it says, 
who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, uh, and and then it goes on to say, you know, in verse 38, Romans chapter 8, verse 38, it says, neither angels nor demons nor any powers, you know, so nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Satan will try his schemes and strategies to hold you down. Okay, so the evil powers will, of course, try to, you know, um, you know, bring in temptations and distract you away from God. They will try from their side, whatever it is, they, they, you know, the, their attempts will be going on. But if you can stay, keep your eyes focused on the Lord, if you can keep your eyes on this resurrection power that is available to you, so and in your time of temptation, if you cry out and say, Lord, you said in your word that your resurrection power is available to me. Now you, by your power, help me to overcome these things that I know that I'm struggling with, these strongholds of sin and temptation, which I know pulling me down. Yes, it is true that Satan is trying to do this work. It is true that Satan is trying to drag me down. But Lord, your resurrection power is far greater than any power or any strategy that Satan was ever going to try and use. Because nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So these are these need to become realities in our mind. At a, at, a, at, a, at a very foundational level of our thinking, these must become established realities because then we will begin to see, it's, a, it's like our eyes will be opened and we will see that this is the status that we have in Christ. This is the confidence that we have in Christ. And then you will really see yourself walking in victory. Why? Not because you know you on your own became super, super powerful all of a sudden, but because you have trusted in the word of God. You trusted that what God said, he will deliver. And because you trusted him in simple childlike faith, he's actually going to do it. You know, I mean, your part is just to trust him and believe that he can actually do something that great in your life. And he will do it. So he has no issues doing his part. He can make you into a spiritual giant. He's not at all worried about that. But are you catching that? Are you believing for that? Are you realizing that you can actually have it? Or are you under the impression, like, you know, those people were back then, at that time they were thinking, oh, the Jewish believers will get all that. But we, will we? And today, of course, we don't think in, uh, that much about the Jewish believers. But, you know, we may be thinking, oh, yeah, those, those world famous evangelists and those world famous preachers. Yeah, yeah, they will, God will do that in them. But in me, can it happen in me? And here we are being given the assurance that, yes, it is not just for them. It is for everyone. OK, so it says that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. So it's not just the other holy people who are who have this advantage. You too have the very same advantage. You too have uh, have that same love you know, which is being extended to you. So you need to become rooted in it. You need to become established uh, in it. OK, so um, that is the uh, the the message which he is bringing out over here and then uh, he says verse 19 you know may, may have power together with all lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of christ to know this love that surpasses knowledge okay so that's verse 19 uh, so so this love of christ that, uh, that 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 he has for you personally it's a love which surpasses knowledge it's infinite so you'll actually never quite grasp it. So if you can never really quite grasp it, why on earth are you being, being asked to measure it? How are you going to measure something which cannot be measured? How do you measure something that's beyond measuring? Over here, the, the, you know, the, the words that I use, the Greek words that I used, where he says, you know, um, uh, so, that you may, um, so that you may grasp how, how wide and long and high. That word grasp over here uh, is literally um, that that Greek word where you know you 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 see something good and you grab onto it, you seize it and you say yes. Now this is mine and I'm going to hold on to it. So he's saying, you know, it's 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 very true that God's love for you is immeasurable. You can never really quite wrap your head around it. But you know, whatever little bit that you're getting a revelation of, grab it, catch hold of it, hold on to it. Don't let sin take that away from your head. You know, so don't let him come with all his negative thoughts and say, because, you know, that's that's his main job, right? He is the accuser. 
so he will say how where will you amount to anything is what he's going to say to you but you who have you know caught these revelations that the, that the lord is you know laying out in the scripture grab hold of it seize it and hold on to it so grasp the extent of the love high of, of, of the length and width and breadth you know um, of god's love you may not be able to understand all of it but whatever you know holy spirit is revealing to you catch it grasp it seize it hold on to it and uh, 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 then it says uh, to know this love that word know which is used over there it is it, it that word over there it means absolute knowing i mean i said you're perfectly 100% confident you know so so grasp hold of what is being revealed to you and know just be 100% confident that this is what god wants to do for you you know so even as we believe in this um because we are you know trusting him with this childlike faith you know he credits it to us as righteousness he will actually make this righteousness start being formed in us he will actually help us and because we are not feeling defeatist anymore you know we will be more willing to cooperate we'll be more eager to 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 cooperate with him in achieving this you know earlier uh, that's the thing about you know um uh, about not um seeing the truth when we have this idea that oh i'm never going to amount to anything we kind of entertain sins we kind of entertain uh, temptations because we are like ah anyway what's going to happen my life is anyway not going to change you know so we don't really uh, we are not very eager but once we catch these truths we become more eager i think ah good if i can just put in that my little bit of cooperation the lord will do the rest and that gives us the the enthusiasm you know to hold on to the uh, lord you know we can talk further about this after we come back from the break uh, it's kind of 9:52 <laughs> went a little beyond uh, so maybe we can come back at 10:2 uh, all right so 10:2 if we can log back in so that you know you can you can have your entire 10 minute break thank you <laughs> 